Alright, so we're continuing on with chapter 10 on statistical physics. Today um, I'd like to cover a little bit of the background on an ideal gas, um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page when we start off talking about ideal gases. Um, the statistics for ideal gases were laid out by Maxwell and Boltzmann. Um, Maxwell is the same Maxwell that uh, have Maxwell's equations for electricity and magnetism. He basically united the two forces of electricity and magnetism by proving that um, light was an electromagnetic wave and using the wave equation and having it derived using Maxwell's equations as well. Um, he was born to a wealthy family. He was an only child. He was well educated. He was educated at first by his mother and then sent off to school a little bit later. But even as a young child, they could see that he was a really promising, smart kid. He walked around, went toddled around when he was about three years old. And he's Scottish, so I always picture this little cute Scottish boy um, saying, what's the goal of that? Because that's what he used to say um, all the time when he was a kid, according to his mother. He would point at things and say, what's the goal of that? Like, how does that work? It's really kind of cute. Um, he wrote his first scientific paper, though, at age 14. He's been voted the third greatest physicist of all time. I bet you can guess who the first two are. Um, but he's highly acclaimed and recognized even in his own lifetime. He worked on a wide variety of topics. He married another scientist that was seven years old than him in 1858 and unfortunately he died at age 48 a pretty young age of abdominal cancer just like his mother did at exactly the same age which is kind of sad um, there's no really no telling uh, what the guy could have accomplished if he'd lived to a ripe old age who knows what he could have done with those remaining years now, the person that worked on him to develop this theory worked with him to develop this theory is uh, Ludwig Boltzmann he was born in Vienna, Austria. Um, now, if everybody loved Maxwell and recognized him during his lifetime, I'm not sure that the same could be said of Boltzmann. Now, people did recognize that he was a great physicist within his lifetime, but there was a lot of arguing going on um, about some of his theories. Um, but he did have popular appeal. Um, he also married uh, another technical science type person, a physics and math teacher, and they had five children. Um, I think his life could have been a lot happier and he could have maybe made it, not committed suicide, if he didn't have bipolar disorder. Um, and he killed himself in 1906. It wasn't his first suicide attempt. So you might hear people say, you know, that if people had understood Boltzmann's work, um, he would have made it. I'm not so sure that's true. He had bipolar disorder. I think there were a lot of people out there that did understand what he was doing. He just felt misunderstood all the time, which is a, a very different thing. Okay, but what they did together um, is to develop this theory of an ideal gas. And so what we're going to do is develop it from the ground up. We're going to start with the first principles physics so that you can see um, some of the important results that come out of this and understand the distribution function a little bit better. Um, you might have seen some of this stuff in an earlier physics class, but um, hopefully this will serve as a reminder if you have. Basically, though, um, you can measure the macroscopic properties of a gas, the pressure, volume, and temperature. You can do that with a variety of instruments. But what we're going to do is take those macroscopic measurements and relate them to the microscopic picture where we treat the ideal gas as a collection of molecules or atoms um, and apply Newton's laws to them and some basic classical mechanics. And we're going to see when we do this that you get the same laws from the microscopic picture as you do from the macroscopic ideal gas law. So there's a number of assumptions that go into the ideal gas law. Now not all of these assumptions hold for real gases, so it's very important to understand what the assumptions are and when they might break down, okay, especially since we're going to be comparing the ideal gas assumptions, which is a classical picture of a gas, to some of the quantum distribution functions later in this chapter, alright? So, First assumption of an ideal gas, you've got a lot of gas molecules and they're really tiny if you compare that to how far apart they're spaced. So but basically, you've got your molecules that if you were to compress them all down and smush them into one space, they would only occupy a very, very, very small portion of your container. So you've got tiny little point particles separated by a lot of space in between. 
Okay, the second assumption is that they obey Newton's laws of motion, but if you looked at the collection, it would look like they were moving randomly. It's only when you can track an individual molecule that it obeys Newton's laws of motion. All right. Um, the molecules interact by short range forces during elastic collisions. What that means is they exert no long range forces on each other. Now, if you think about it, that means that your gas molecules all have to be neutral. They cannot be charged, okay? And they can't be dipoles either, okay? So they can't attract one another through electrical forces. And we're going to ignore the negligible contribution that, of course, the law of gravitation would have between two gas molecules. That's going to be a very small number, okay? So no intermolecular interactions. We don't want something that's going to react chemically. Okay. Next, when the molecules bounce, they make elastic collisions with each other, but also with the walls. So you've got a gas molecule pinging around. Let's say it's in this little QB container over here, and it hits the wall and it bounces right off, and it keeps all of its initial kinetic energy during that collision. Okay? We're also going to assume for now that it's a pure substance. So you've got a collection of helium molecules, right? And only helium. We're going to assume that. Now, a lot of the assumptions that we make for a pure substance are also going to hold for a mixture of gases. For example, you can treat the air we breathe pretty well as an ideal gas and it will work, even though it's a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen and then some other trace components. Okay. so. You often picture an ideal gas as consisting of single atoms. Um, so you're picturing like, for example, one of the noble gases that doesn't bond to anything else like helium. However, it does work well for diatomic gases as long as the uh, pressure and temperature are pretty low. Okay, So for example, the nitrogen in the air we breathe is two nitrogen molecules. It's a diatomic gas. Um, the ideal gas uh, model works pretty well to describe that as well. All right, so getting into the nuts and bolts of the thing now. Let's assume that we have a cubicle container, all right? It's just easier, all right? We're going to say that the cube has sides with length d. And what we're going to do is we're going to track the motion of one molecule of that ideal gas in terms of its velocity components. And then we're going to look at the momentum transfer or the momentum change as it collides with the wall of the container and relate that to an average force that it exerts on the wall of the container. So going here, let's assume that we have this little ideal gas molecule and it pings off the side of the container and then bounces up as is shown here in the figure. All right, so this is a perfectly elastic collision. So the velocity of the particle is going to be the same before and after. Okay, no velocity, of course, is going to get transferred to the wall of the container. It's way much more massive. Okay, so it's just not going to happen. Now, if you think about and you remember the equation for impulse, all right? Remember, Newton's second law. The force is equal to the time rate of change of the momentum. So if you look at a short enough time interval delta t, you can say that your average force is equal to the change in your momentum delta p divided by delta t, right? If you multiply both sides of that equation through by delta t, then you have the change in the momentum, and that's equal to the average force exerted on the wall of the container or on the molecule times delta t. Okay, now if you look here, you've got this perfectly elastic collision and you have the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection here. Okay, now what that means is that if you look here, the magnitude of your x velocity is the same, but the sign changes, right? So if it's going in the positive direction before the collision, it'll be going in the negative x direction after the collision. We're really only concerned about the change in the x because the change in the y you can see it doesn't change at all it's going up when it collides it's going up when it leaves so we're only interested in the components that are perpendicular to the wall and that in this particular case is the x okay so if you look at the change in the momentum you would have the mass of the molecule and then you would have final minus initial um, and so you would end up with uh, 2 times the magnitude of your x component okay so your fx, your force on the x in the average times delta t is equal to 2 times the mass times the x component of the velocity, right? And that's the force on the wall, which is to the right. All right, now, 
if you were to look at this gas molecule pinging back and forth, all right, and you would measure the time interval between collisions of the same molecule with the same wall. So it's over here, right? It hits this wall, it bounces off, it hits that wall, and it comes back and bounces back on the first wall. Then the distance that it would have to travel would be equal to 2D because it would have to traverse the container two times. So that's 2D. And then so your time interval would be equal to 2D divided by your x velocity. Okay? So that's that. Now, if you want to then stick in your equation for your force is your change in your momentum over your change in time. Remember, we found the change in the momentum delta P was equal to 2mvxi, and then we divide that by our delta T. But then we plug in for our delta T, the 2d over vxi, we plug in for delta T there, and then we end up with mvxi squared over d, right? So that gives us our average force in x for one molecule, the ith molecule, all right? Sorry about that. Um, for the ith molecule. And then for n molecules in the box, you would multiply times the number of molecules. You would assume that um, basically you're taking an average here and you would sum over all the particles and divide by um, n. So you, your average vx average squared would be equal to the sum of all your little vxi squared and then divide that by n. And so your average force on average, your force on average, sorry, would be equal to the mass times the number of particles times the average velocity in x squared and then divided by d, okay? Now, it's only the x force on the wall that matters here for the pressure on it. All the others are going to cancel out, okay? It's only the, the direction perpendicular to your wall. If your direction is completely random, then your speed squared would be equal to the sum of the components of the velocity squared, right? So you have your vx squared plus your vy squared plus your vz squared. If it's completely random, you would expect all those to be roughly the same. And so v squared would be equal to 3 times vx squared, right? Because all of them are the same. And then you plug in for that. Um, in your equation for your average force, and then you get mass times the number of particles times V average squared divided by 3D, okay? Now, we're going to use our definition of a pressure. Pressure is a force per unit area, right? So if you want the pressure on one of the walls of your cubic container, then you would take the force on that wall and then divide by the area of the wall. The area of the wall, it's just a square, is D squared. So you have your force over d squared. Now plug in for your force, and then you have your pressure, mass times the number of particles times v squared divided by 3d cubed now. All right? So if you want to insert, this looks like an mv squared here. sounds kind of like a kinetic energy, which is kind of exciting. So if you want it to be a kinetic energy, you stick in a 1 half up there, and you group 1 half mv squared. And if you stick in a 1 half there, you have to multiply by 2 out front. Okay, so now you have two-thirds times n times your kinetic energy over d cubed. All right, so your relationship is now in there, okay? You have a pressure, which is two-thirds n over v times your kinetic energy, right? So this tells us that the pressure exerted on the wall by the gas is proportional to the number of molecules per unit volume. So the more molecules that you cram into a smaller space, right, the higher your pressure, that makes sense. And then it's also proportional to your kinetic energy of your molecules, okay? So this is an equation that relates macroscopic quantities like pressure, okay, and average values of kinetic energy and so on and so forth. It relates macroscopic values and it was derived from looking at the microscopic components of the gas. So that's cool. That's an achievement. Now one way to increase the pressure is to increase the number of molecules per unit volume and then you can also increase the speed or the kinetic energy of the molecules and that increases your pressure. Now, if you want to relate this equation that we've derived, this two-thirds n over v times your kinetic energy, and now you want to relate that in another way to your pressure, we can use our ideal gas law, okay? The ideal gas law, as hopefully you've learned multiple times now, is that PV is equal to NKT. PV, pressure volume, N, total number of molecules, K, Boltzmann's constant, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin, and then T is your temperature. 
So now if you plug in in Boltzmann's, um, I'm sorry, if you rearrange the ideal gas law for your pressure, then you have NKT over V. Now if we set that equal to what we've already derived, then you have this little relationship here, okay? Two-thirds N over V times one-half MV squared is equal to N over V times KT, all right? So what you can do here, you can cancel out the N over V on both sides of that equation, and you end up with this little expression here. Your kinetic energy on average, one-half MV squared, is equal to three-halves KT, right? Now, here we've had three degrees of freedom. We had translational motion in X and Y and Z, and there's your factor three right there. So what we can say is that you can apply that to each direction that for each degree of freedom in your kinetic energy, in your x, in your y, in your z, you get one half kt of energy out of it. So you'd have similar expressions for the x and the y as the one that you have for this little expression right here. Okay? So this leads us to the idea, which is pretty fundamental, of the equipartition of energy. Okay, so this is the theorem of equipartition of energy. Each translational degree of freedom contributes an equal amount to the energy of the gas. Okay, in general, a degree of freedom refers to an independent means by which a molecule can possess energy, in this case, the energy of motion or kinetic energy, right? And your x, y, and your z directions are all independent degrees of freedom there. Each degree of freedom contributes one half kT to the energy of a system, all right? And possible degrees of freedom are those associated with the translation, rotation, and vibration of molecules. The theorem of equipartition of energy cannot be overstressed, all right? It's one of those really key concepts. We're going to keep coming back to it um, as we go along for the rest of the course. All right, so your total kinetic energy for your system would just be the number of molecules in times the kinetic energy of each molecule. So you have your total kinetic energy is equal to 3 halves NKT. All right? If you have a gas, like an ideal gas, with only translational kinetic energy, because there's really no other kind of energy that you're taking into account when you're discussing the theory of an ideal gas, all right? Then your kinetic energy is the internal energy of the gas. Right? It's called internal energy because if you were to just look at a collection of gases like I'm doing right now, you can't really tell how hot or cold it is. Right, So that's why they call it internal energy. So the internal energy of an ideal gas depends only on the temperature. Here you have this expression that tells you that that is true. You have an, a collection of gas molecules in gas molecules. right? And then this is your kinetic energy, and it's only proportional to the number of gas molecules, which you can hold as fixed, and then the thing that you would vary would be the temperature. So as you increase the temperature, your internal energy goes up. As you decrease it, it goes down, as long as the number of molecules stays constant. This also um, allows us to speak of the root mean square speed for uh, an ideal gas. The root mean square speed just uses that 1 half mv squared is equal to 3 halves um, kT expression, and then it solves for v. And this gives us the root mean square speed, okay? So if you solve for that, then your root mean square speed is just equal to 3 kT over m, and you take the square root of that, all right? If you want to put it in terms of the gas constant and the molar mass, it's 3 halves big RT divided by the mass, molar mass, where R is your gas constant. In SI units, that's 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin, but you can look that up. Some typical RMS speeds for an ideal gas at room temperature, um, the smaller the gas, of course, the faster it will go at a given temperature. So your diatomic hydrogen gas there was going almost 2,000 meters per second, whereas if you look at carbon dioxide, it's going like 400 meters per second at the same temperature just because it's so much bigger. All right, some more reminders, I hope they're reminders, um, from your first couple of semesters of physics. When we're talking about internal energy and thermodynamics, we're talking about the total energy of the system, the internal energy of the system. This can be changed by changing, uh, by 
heat or work. Heat is defined as the transfer of energy across the boundary of a system due to a temperature difference between the system and its surroundings. So for example, put taking a, a pan and putting it on a hot burner on a stove, that's a heat transfer, right? You can also change the internal energy of a gas by work, by compressing it or expanding the gas, you can change the internal energy. Like if you compress a gas with a piston, you're changing the energy by work. Here is a little cartoon which illustrates that. You have a piston and you're pushing down on the piston, compressing the gas. The formula to relate um, the work, the pressure, and the volume is pretty famous. Hopefully you remember it. The work is equal to minus PdV and then you integrate that where P is your pressure and dV is your volume. All right. So what this means is that if the gas is compressed, then dV is negative and then you multiply that negative dV by a negative out front and that gives you a positive work so that means that work is done on the gas and vice versa okay so it takes work to compress a gas now the first law of thermodynamics is actually a special case of the law of conservation of energy and basically what it's saying is that if the internal energy of a system changes, delta E internal, then it's done by either heat or work, right? So here you have delta E internal is equal to Q plus W. Q is usually the symbol that they use for heat transfer. Heat capacity of a particular sample is the amount of energy that is needed to raise the temperature of that sample by one degree Celsius. So if you have an energy transferred by heat to the system, then how much that temperature changes is regulated by the heat capacity. So Q is equal to C delta T. Now C, the big C, capital C, can actually change depending on how much of a gas you have, which is why we're going to get into molar specific heats, right? Because then you need to take into account how much of a gas, because of course it takes more heat to heat up more gas, right? That, that makes sense. Now several processes can actually change the temperature of an ideal gas. Um, since uh, the internal energy of an ideal gas is pretty much exactly regulated by the temperature, then you can say that delta T is always proportional to delta E, right? But you can get from temperature 1 to temperature 2 by different kind of paths. So that's shown here on this PV diagram. You have your isotherm, which is plotted using uh, PV is equal to nRT. So that means that, you know, PV multiplied together gives the same constant, which shows up as these hyperbole here on these curves. So you can get from um, temperature one to temperature two by a various number of paths that give you different values of pressures and volumes for your final gas, right? You can get there by different paths. So the heat transfer associated with a particular change in temperature isn't unique, right? You can do more work and then you have to supply less heat and so on and so forth. So what we're going to do is we're going to define some specific heats for two processes, um, those with constant pressure and those with constant volume. Now the reality might be that neither of those things is constant, but you've got to stick a path in there somewhere. So we chose the constant pressure and the constant volume path because those are the two easiest ones to think about. Now remember, Oftentimes these formula are molar specific heats, so we're going to speak in terms of moles now instead of molecules. Remember that one mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of or molecules of the gas. The molar specific heat can be defined now as Q is equal to N, the number of moles, times C sub V, which is the heat capacity at constant volume, times the temperature difference delta T. Okay, so we've gotten specific. And for constant pressure processes, we define a different heat capacity, and that Q would be equal to N C sub P delta T. C sub V and C sub P are not equal. Okay, it's a different amount of heat transferred, depending on whether you're doing a constant volume or a constant pressure process. In fact, the constant pressure value will always be greater than the constant volume value for a given number of moles and for a given temperature change. Okay, now how those two things are related, we're going to discuss a little bit more starting now. Let's just do this for a monatomic gas. That just means 
a gas of one atom, like a noble gas such as helium, okay? If you add energy to a monatomic gas, then all of that energy has to go into increasing the translational kinetic energy of the gas. There's just nowhere else to put it. So that means that your change in your internal energy is going to equal to 3 halves little n rt, or 3 halves big N kt, as we showed and derived earlier, okay? Either one. These are equivalent expressions. Now, delta T here is just a function of your temperature, and in general, the internal energy of an ideal gas is always going to be just a function of your temperature. Now, let's look at the constant volume process first. So here, in a constant volume process, remember that the work is equal to minus P dV. So if the volume doesn't change, no work is done. So the work is zero in a constant volume um, case. That means via the first law of thermodynamics that the change in the internal energy is just going to equal to the heat because the work is zero. Now we have our expression for how the heat changes or what the relationship is between the heat and the change in the temperature for a constant volume process. That's N C sub V delta T. So here we have delta E internal is equal to N C sub V delta T. Okay. Now, if you set what we know is true for the change in the internal energy of an ideal gas, that is that delta E internal is 3 halves NR delta T, and then you set that equal to NC sub V delta T, then you can solve. Your N's cancel out and so do your delta T's, and that gives you your heat capacity at constant volume is 3 halves times your gas constant. Plugging in R is equal to 8.314, you get that the heat capacity at constant volume for a monatomic gas is 12.5 joules per mole Kelvin. And that's in very good agreement with the experimental results for monatomic gases like helium. Now, if instead you want to think of a constant pressure process, for a constant pressure process there would be work done on the system. So then you'd have delta E internal is equal to Q plus W. All right, your Q for a constant pressure process would be N C sub P delta T, and your work is minus P delta V, right? Now, using the ideal gas law, PV is equal to NRT, in a constant pressure process, you'd have P delta V, P would be a constant, and P delta V would be equal to NR delta T. So here, subbing in for P delta V, we have in our internal energy now, N C sub P delta T is e minus N R delta T, and that's our expression. Now we can factor out N and delta T, and then we have N delta T times C sub P minus R, and then we set that equal to the change in the internal energy for the gas, 3 halves N R delta T. And yet, in we, yet again, we can cancel out the N and the delta T, and we end up with C sub P minus R is 3 halves R, which means that C sub P is 5 halves R. Now, the difference between the heat capacity at constant pressure and the heat capacity at constant volume then would always be R for a monatomic ideal gas because C sub V is 3 halves R, right? So you've proven, we've proven, that C sub P is always greater than C sub V, C sub P is 5 halves R, and C sub V is 3 halves R for a monatomic ideal gas. If you want to look at the ratio, which is sometimes used for certain processes in thermodynamics, the ratio of molar specific heats would be 5 halves R over 3 halves R, which gives you 1.67, okay? So if you look at the theory for that and you look at your monatomic gases, your ideal gases, helium, argon, neon, krypton, things like that, then you can see that your C sub V and your C sub P are 12.5 and 20.8 pretty much, which is in perfect agreement with the theory on this, okay? So here we have very good agreement. Now you notice though that if we go to diatomic gases and polyatomic gases, the numbers just aren't as good. So there's some other things going on with those gases. So what is going on with those gases? Well, the internal energy of more complex gases has to include contributions from other degrees of freedom. So in a monatomic ideal gas, you've just got the thing bouncing around, and it's just one atom, so it can't really rotate or vibrate with respect to itself. That's not happening. But now if you have, say, for example, a diatomic gas, it's vibrating and it's rotating in three dimensions. And so that adds on more degrees of freedom, okay?
So you have to consider the translational still, but you also have to consider the rotational. And remember for a diatomic gas, that'll give you two more degrees of freedom. And then you have to consider the vibrational degrees of freedom, and that's gonna give you two more degrees of freedom. Now this seems a little strange, but the deal is that you get a degree of freedom for your kinetic energy, and you get a degree of freedom for your potential energy. And then the, the thing is just vibrating along the axis of the spring that's there, okay? So your degrees of freedom, your two degrees of freedom for your vibration come from kinetic and potential energy. So let's add it up. For a diatomic gas, you've got your three degrees of freedom for translational motion. You've got two more degrees of freedom for your vibrational motion and two more degrees of freedom for your rotational motion. And therefore, via the theorem of equipartition of energy, we've got one half kT or one half RT, right? one half nRT for each degree of freedom. And we have three plus two plus two, seven degrees of freedom, which means that our internal energy should be seven halves nRT. Now, if you look at what's going on with diatomic gases, what you'll see is not quite that. What you'll see is that there's a dependence in the temperature on the number of degrees of freedom that you have. When you're at really low temperatures, you only see the three degrees of freedom that come from the translational motion. When you're at higher temperatures, like room temperature, you unlock the rotational degrees of freedom and you add on those two. Then you have to heat the gas up even more to unlock those vibrational degrees of freedom. All right? So at low temperatures, a diatomic gas acts just like a monatomic gas, and then the rotation kicks in, and finally the vibration. All right? So at very high temperatures, our theory agrees with our experiment. We have that CV is equal to seven halves R. So what's going on with that? Well, oh, and I should say, I should add this, um, that complex molecules for more than two atoms, you've got even more degrees of freedom, and so you have even higher heat capacities, which is, it gets kind of crazy. All right, but what's going on with um, some of these unlocking of these degrees of freedom? Well, for that, Classical mechanics really isn't enough. You have to go on and, and use some of the quantum mechanics that we learned in the previous chapter about rotational and vibrational uh, spectra of molecules, all right? So what that tells us is that it's not this continuous thing where it can vibrate at any old energy it wants to as it vibrates, right? It gonna, it's going to jump up in terms of energy levels. And if it doesn't have enough energy or temperature, if it's not hot enough for it to jump up to that next energy level, then it's just stuck. It's stuck in that lowest ground state vibration, right? So that's why you have to really turn the temperature on the gas up in order to get um, the vibrational degrees of freedom unlocked and to see that happen. Now, the rotational energy states, as you might remember, are much closer together in energy, so they can be achieved. You can jump up in degrees of freedom and rotational states at lower temperatures, but remember that the vibrational states are spaced further apart, and that's why it takes higher temperatures to unlock those values, okay? so. That kind of concludes what I wanted to say um, in this chapter on the background of ideal gases and all that kind of stuff. Um, just adding in that um, at room temperature, you've achieved your rotational degrees of freedom. At 1,000 degrees Kelvin, which is pretty hot, you start to reach your vibrational, some of those vibrational modes. And at 10,000, the vibration is contributing fully to the internal energy. All right. so. Um, I hope that wasn't too long and drawn out for you. Um, maybe it was some review for some of you. Um, but if you do have any questions, let me know. And a lot of the information that I went over, you can find in introductory textbooks on physics like Gene Coley, like your Sir William Jewett or whatever else. So if you need a little bit more foundation of this, you can look it up. Hyperphysics might also be a good um, source, an online source for this kind of information.